The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make prize picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three-pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the PrizePix community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Hello there. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 877 973 7425. Glad to have you with me. Um, I, I, so I got a. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be diverse in topics, but there is a, a related topic that I think we probably need to deal with from something we've been talking about. I, I You know, the, the don't say gay bill that they call it, it's actually the Parental Rights and Education Act in Florida. It's probably going to pass. Uh, it's going to be signed into law. Ron DeSantis supports it. It doesn't do what the critics say it does. It, it's a bunch of hysteria. Uh, and, and the primary reason is because we, we live in a, a highly sexualized society. Let's just acknowledge it. I mean, have you seen Halloween costumes? Uh, the willingness of Halloween costume manufacturers to whore out your five-year-old daughter in a Halloween costume is just absolutely absurd. And the fact that there are parents who will do it uh, is, is a pretty damning indictment on our current society. It's ridiculous. And uh, parents, believe it or not, uh, normal parents who actually pay attention to their children's upbringing and well-being really don't think their kindergartner needs to learn about sex, uh, whether heterosexual, homosexual, or anything else. But Disney employees have been staging walkouts. Now, in particular, it's California Disney employees have been staging a walkout to protest the Florida law. On ESPN, announcers at uh, NCAA basketball games and, and other sporting events have had moments of silence on air to protest the Florida law. Now, they depend on the ignorance of the American people because when you actually ask parents, do you think your kindergarten, first, second, or third grader needs to learn about sex in school, they overwhelmingly say no. I wonder about the 20% who say yes. But like 80% of parents say no. I wonder about the parents who say yes. But I, I, I need you to focus on, on just this one thing. Disney employees are walking out over a, a law in Florida. ESPN anchors are staging moments of silence to protest the law. Apple has released a statement condemning the law. Here's a headline from National Review. ESPN broadcasters hold moment of silence to protest Florida's parental rights bill on LGBT education. Now I want to read you an NBC News headline. As the China NBA crisis continues, ESPN toes its no politics line. The network's coverage of what is one of the biggest sports stories of the year underscores the challenge ESPN faces in attempting to stay away from politics. It's from Claire Atkinson, October 9th of 2019. ESPN is keeping politics and criticism of China out of its coverage of the NBA's widely panned handling of a tweet about the Hong Kong protesters. The tweet from a Houston Rockets executive since deleted read, Fight for Freedom, Stand with Hong Kong, and kicked off a backlash in China with sponsors there immediately dropping the league and state television, canceling broadcasts of preseason games. 
Fan events in China scheduled for Wednesday were also canceled. The story gained momentum over the weekend and continued to develop. It's the kind of story in ESPN could not avoid despite its efforts to sideline politics. On Tuesday, Deadspin obtained an email from ESPN senior news editor uh, Chuck Salaturo, Salaturo sent to select producers to reiterate company policy on avoiding talk of Chinese or Hong Kong politics. David Scott, a spokesman for ESPN, said the company had issued guidance that reiterated the channel's efforts to stay focused on the NBA. So ESPN said it couldn't talk about politics when the Chinese were gunning down Hong Kong protesters and rounding them up and making them disappear. But a law that a democratically elected legislature in Florida might pass and be signed by the governor of Florida that has support from a majority of residents of the state of Florida who vote, ESPN can stage moments of silence for. Disney workers will walk out of the job to protest a mischaracterized law in Florida, but are perfectly happy getting a paycheck from a company with blood on its hands in China. And yes, Disney, Apple, Nike, the NBA, they've all got blood on their hands over this stuff. For all of Apple's talk about uh, monitoring labor relations in China, again and again and again, it comes up that Apple is actually uh, not as secure in its, its chain of workers as it claims to be, as China has continually offered workers to companies in China and largely forced them to do their jobs. I mean, these are Chinese communists, by the way. A Chinese communist society, not everybody gets a choice in where they want to work. And they work for cheap. Nike wants to lecture Americans on civil rights and human rights and makes a killing out of its child labor force in China, or has in the past, and, and hardly does anything about it. Disney actually filmed multiple movies, including the, the um, Mulan movie, in the part of China where the actual concentration camps exist. And it's not me saying they're concentration camps. It's the people who've escaped from them and told the world what's going on there. And did the Disney employees walk out? No. So I guess trans rights aren't human rights because Disney won't protest human rights, just trans rights. They've otherized transgender people to begin with. That or they've otherized Asian people as something less than worth protesting about. Why do does Disney hate Asian people? Why will Apple condemn a law in Florida but not divest itself of China where the Chinese authoritarian communists run concentration camps, internment camps, disappear people, and do not share the values that Apple claims to hold? Why will Nike lecture us on human rights, but not China? Well, of course, the answer is very simple. To quote what, uh, Rashida Tlaib or Ilhan Omar or whichever one of them was, it's all about the Benjamins. It's all about the money. It's the same reason that Christians in the United States are lectured routinely by progressive activists and Muslims are not. You can put Christ on a crucifix in a jar of urine and be fairly certain your house is not going to get bombed or your head taken off your shoulders. You put Muhammad, let alone drawing a picture of Muhammad, you put the picture of Muhammad you drew in a jar of urine, you're going to have to have security for the rest of your life. I mean, there's there's a disproportionality that comes with this. For a while there, it was, it was really all the trend from, from the left. Hey, we're going to draw Muhammad cartoons. We're tired of drawing the Jesus cartoons. We'll draw the Muhammad cartoons. And then the Islamic terrorists showed up at Charlie Hebdo and cut off the heads of all the people who worked there. You don't see very many Muhammad cartoons drawn anymore, do you? You can pick on the Christians because the Christians will turn the other cheek. The Muslims will cut off your head. It's very much the same with this. You can lecture Americans about their human rights because Americans will let you do it. But you do it to China, the Chinese are coming for you. And when your production line is in China 
and you keep your costs low because of China and you covet access to the Chinese box office like Disney, you're not going to protest China. You're not going to say anything. So really what we have is we have a bunch of woke Disney employees who are cowards. They like to pretend to be brave. Disney employees will mischaracterize a law and then uh, get a lunchtime break and claim they're protesting. They're giving up their lunch hour so they can feel good about themselves lecturing other Americans on values. But none of these Disney employees who care about a mischaracterized law in Florida are going to walk off the job to protest something that really matters. The lives of human beings in China who are in internment camps, who are forced to work against their will, whose parents and children are being separated so the children can be indoctrinated into communism against their parents' will, or the Hong Kong free speech protesters. ESPN can say, well, we don't talk politics on ESPN. We can't talk about what's happening in China. But they can hold moments of silence and tell you all. They sure weren't silent in telling you why they were going to be silent. It was all politics. But wait, ESPN says they have a no politics policy when it comes to talking about China. ESPN, of course, owned by Disney. ABC News is not going to lecture anybody about China because ABC News is owned by Disney and Disney wants access to the box office uh, in China, even though China has been denying Disney the box office. China hasn't let Disney run a number of movies in China. But they're still doing their best to get an to get a deal there. In addition to co-owning ESPN with Hearst, Disney has a deal with Tencent, the Chinese entertainment company that agreed in 2016 to carry ESPN content in its territory. Disney also owns a theme park in Shanghai and broad movie distribution operations. Let's see the Disney employees protest that. They, they don't really have conviction here. They have easy conviction. They have signaling their virtue. It's very easy to walk off the job at Disney to protest a law in another state and know that Disney's going to pat you on the head while you go after these other Americans you find bigoted. But you're going to lose your job at Disney if you go after Disney for making money off of China. All of these employees have blood on their hands, and they know it. They're not saying anything. It's real easy for Tim Cook to lecture Florida on Florida's proposed law. Tim Cook is not going to say jack to China because Tim Cook likes to go to China, likes to have his employees go to China, and likes to do business in China and covets a part of the Chinese market for Apple's iPhone. Nike's perfectly happy sending Colin Kaepernick out to poo-poo you and lecture you about your values, but they'll never say anything about China because of the money. It's all about the money. These people are willing to take easy positions that won't cost them anything except maybe some disdain from conservative talk show hosts. But they won't take a matter of conviction and stand up for it when it really matters. And does it really mean anything when it costs you nothing to do? There's no hardship for woke employees at Disney to stand with other woke employees. The real conviction comes from the conservative employees at Disney who don't feel safe being public about their support of the Florida law. They're the ones who have something to lose. They'll be ganged up on by the progressive wokes at Disney who are no better than the authoritarians in China, by the way. And that is something that should be pointed out here. The people at Apple and Nike and Disney they're really not a whole lot better than the authoritarians at, at, in China. It takes them to know them. They're perfectly happy bullying, censoring you, and punishing anyone who dissents from their woke line, just like the Chinese are. And they'll continue to do business with the Chinese. It always reminds me, whether it's the Islamic radicals chopping off people's heads or the Chinese doing what they're doing or the Disney employees who won't say anything about China but will certainly lecture conservatives in Florida over their views, the things of the world get along very well with the things of the world. It's the things of God the things of the world hate. Hello there. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 877-973-7425 should you be interested in being on this year program. 
Uh, now, let me see. Do I? Yes, I've got time. I am going to go to John. You're going to be up next, John. Welcome. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Eric, uh, for taking my call. Uh, we did see weeks ago buildup of Russia on the border of Ukraine, and eventually they attacked Ukraine. Well, I'm calling you from Georgia, and uh, my congresswoman sent an email to me saying, stand up for Ukraine. All right, and I understand that. But we see this buildup of China going against Taiwan. So if that does happen, China invades Taiwan, <laughs> whom are they going to tell me to stand up for? China, right. the, the CCP, or Taiwan? Oh, Hello? you know, a, you know. A, a lot of these people, that they're going to cast a blind eye on it and pretend it's not happening. I mean that that's the, oh, no. that's the sad truth of the matter is that a lot of these people are going to willfully pretend that um you know for example China has gone above and beyond itself in making sure that very few countries on planet earth uh, recognize Taiwan's sovereignty I think there are only out of 198 countries 17 recognize Taiwan's sovereignty and then that'll be a pass for a lot of people as well you know I mean the Chinese there it's just a, it's an internal territorial dispute Disney's going to do nothing. None of these people are going to do anything. Uh, they, they really have become moral cowards when it comes to this stuff. Uh, they won't speak up. They won't talk. They won't take action. They won't do anything. We see this time and time again around the country uh, with these uh, major corporations. Now, listen, it costs them money. Uh, and, and I get that. I mean, like, for example, uh, I get angry emails all the time from people. In fact, I just got so, some uh, deeply disturbed email from a lady who's upset uh, because I advertise for, for Eden Pure. I like their products. Their product is made in China. You cannot find an air purifier in the United States that costs reasonably that isn't made in China. Same thing. Do you have a Traeger grill? It's made in China. Do you have a computer? Do you have an iPhone? It's made. Do you have an Android device? Made, everything's made in China. As an American, you can't avoid it. You cannot avoid it. And I don't think it's on you individually, your job to go out of your way, to drive up your own cost to say, well, I can't buy any of these things because they're made in China. That's the way corporate America works. You can certainly lobby for and agitate for these companies to move their production out of China, as I think you should as we should. But I'm not going to tell an American citizen, well, I've got this product for you to buy. It's 25,000% more expensive than this other product. But hey, you can feel good about yourself because it's not manufactured in China. Uh, good for you if you want to avoid everything made from China. But I personally don't have the time to go through and nitpick every single thing in my life or yours that is made in China. I don't think companies should be doing business there. I am very adamant that they shouldn't. But I also recognize that until we can move production capacity elsewhere, it's hard for companies too. But we should also note their employees are perfectly willing to make a ton of money from these companies, uh, even as they want to blast others. It, it, that's the hypocrisy there. You buying a product from China is not the hypocrisy. It's the companies uh, thinking they can opine on one set of laws and not another because they're scared of it. That's the ridiculous part. Hello there. It is Eric Erickson here. Well, the phone number here, 877-973-7425, should you wish to be a part of this here program. Uh, I saw, uh, where was it, uh, Newt Gingrich, I guess, was on uh, something the other day where, yeah, last night where he was talking about um, Kamala Harris and just how bad of a candidate Kamala Harris is. And you can't really dispute that. She is actually a pretty thoroughly terrible uh, official. She wasn't good on the campaign trail, and she's just really not good on the stump. And now, Deep Thoughts by Kamala Harris. Talking about the significance of the passage of time. Right, the significance of the passage of time. 
So when you think about it, there is great significance to the passage of time in terms of what we need to do to lay these wires, what we need to do to create these jobs. And there is such great significance to the passage of time. That was Deep Thoughts by Kamala Harris. (laughs) Such significance to the passage of time. Her deep thoughts. Kamala Harris really is uh, not a great candidate, uh, not a great vice president. She was not a great senator or attorney general in California. She's driven by the desire for positive press. Now, how bad is it? Well, uh, the Politico playbook today has a story out about uh, Anna Wintour uh, of Vogue magazine fame. Uh, upsetting Kamala Harris. Let me just read you some of this. Tensions between Vice President Kamala Harris and President Joe Biden and their teams began before inauguration and involved not just complicated issues like mass migration at the southern border, but cover photos of glossy magazines. In the two weeks before Inauguration Day, Harris dispatched aides to address the upcoming issue of Vogue, according to an exclusive excerpt of the upcoming book, This Will Not Pass, Trump, Biden, and the Battle for America's Future, by Jonathan Martin and Alexander Burns. The leaked cover photo, which featured Vice President-elect Harris in Converse shoes and skinny pants, was approachable but less than grand depiction of the incoming vice president, reporters wrote. Harris had been expecting a different photo, one that was ultimately made the digital cover. Vogue eventually sold a limited edition issue with that picture. Harris was wounded. She felt belittled by the magazine, asking aides, would Vogue depict another world leader this way? Harris's incoming press secretary, Simone Sanders, who declined to comment, reached Vogue editor Anna Wintour to convey Harris's frustration. Wintour, who did not respond to a request for comment, protested she had chosen the picture personally because it made Harris relatable. Incoming chief of staff Tina Flournoy was caught off guard by the anger in Harris's circles and contacted a senior Biden campaign official. Given the country's myriad crises and the recent January 6th riot at the Capitol, the Biden advisor told Flournoy that this was not the time to be going to war with Vogue over a comparatively trivial aesthetic issue. Tina, the advisor said, these are first world problems, according to the expert uh, excerpt. This was an early indication that members of the Biden-Harris team were on different pages with different priorities. The dynamic didn't improve from there. Martin and Burns document an increasingly fraught relationship between the West Wing and the vice president's office filled with anger, eye-rolling, portfolio feuds, real and perceived slights. Some of Harris's advisors believe the president's almost entirely white inner circle did not show the vice president the respect she deserved. Harris worried that Biden's staff looked down on her. She fixated on real and perceived snubs in ways the West Wing found tedious. At one point, Harris dispatched Flournoy to talk to top Biden advisor Anita Dunn to convey displeasure that White House staff was not standing up for Harris when she entered the room the way they did for Biden. The vice president took it as a sign of disrespect. Dunn told West Wing Playbook she wasn't going to comment except to say that everyone in the West Wing has a high degree of respect for the vice president, the hard work she's doing for the president. Oh, 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 where do we even begin here? The vice president of the United States got her feelings hurt. That people did not stand up for her when she entered the room. The way those people stood up for the president of the United States. I forget which vice president it was. Was it Nance? I can't remember who described the vice president's job as uh, office as a, a warm bucket of spit. You're the vice president, lady. You're not the president of the United States. Smile and be seen. That's your job. 
That's your job. Smile and be seen. Your job, frankly, this is going to come across crass to some of you, but it's the truth. The truth is not meant to be mean. And the truth is that Vice President Harris is supposed to stand up and be seen as a black woman standing next to the old white man. That is her job. Her job is not to speak. Her job is not to think. Her job is to be a black female mannequin standing next to Joe Biden because he apparently has a thing for black women. I mean, that's why he wants Katanji Brown Jackson on the Supreme Court. He wants black woman. Why? Because Joe Biden believes he owes his presidency to black women. And so he is giving them figures that he thinks they can relate to. He doesn't care if they're seen or heard or thoughtful or anything. He just wants them around him. So black women think they got something from Joe Biden. That's it. Kamala Harris isn't getting anything other than the title vice president. She gets a jet. She gets a house. She gets a title. She can shut the hell up. That sounds mean. I'm sorry, but Vice President Harris, frankly, needs to man up. (gasps) Yeah, I said it that way. Who cares about the slights? You are the Vice President of the United States. You know what your job is? Your job is to break ties in the United States Senate and show up if the president kicks the bucket. That's it. That is your whole job. You want meaning from a job? It is meaningless in the Constitution unless there's a tie in the center of the president dies. That's it. Did you not know this going into this? This president calls his administration the Biden-Harris administration. No other president has done that. And you know what it is? It's meaningless. It's meaningless doesn't matter. No one's going to remember it as the Biden-Harris administration any more than they remember it as the Trump-Pence administration, the Bush-Cheney administration, the Clinton-Gore administration, the Obama-Biden administration. Nobody, Nobody cares about the vice president. Your position is a position wherein no one has to care. They just know you're there if the other guy dies. What vanity it must be. What vanity it must be for the Vice President of the United States to think she is entitled to any sort of respect. She's the one who agreed to put on the Converse shoes and the skinny jeans and never asked for a preview so that she had the right to object. I have been put in situations And let's just be honest, in the grand scheme of things, I'm a nobody. And I've been put in situations and asked to be filmed and photographed where I objected. And I got to tell you, uh, this came from me being at CNN where uh, when I started at CNN, they put me in a sports bar, uh, Dan Tana's, in, in the CNN Center in Atlanta. And I was on every night on CNN, and would, and I liked the sports bar. They gave me free beer. And I'd sit there between segments and have a beer, and it was great. But the head of talent at CNN called me after a couple of weeks. This She said, this is disrespectful to you. You should not allow it. I said, what do you mean? She says, well, everyone else is in a, a TV booth looking like an analyst, and they're going to the conservative at the bar for his opinion. It makes you seem less than them. You shouldn't put up with it. I Look, I was just doing my job. I didn't know. Didn't know I could object. It's what they told me they wanted. And so I said, hey, She has this concern. I really didn't care. I enjoyed it, but she cared greatly for how it made me, how it made me look. And every time after that, I was very mindful of, are they making me look like everyone else? That Kamala Harris can get to the vice presidency of the United States and not learn that lesson is actually kind of staggering. She consented to be in that photo sheet. She consented to have that picture taken. She consented to that wardrobe. And then to say, well, it makes me look like I'm I'm light and vapid. Well, you are. It captured you accurately if that's your concern. As opposed to you could just pack up and move on. I mean, grow a pair. Apparently you can these days if you socially constructed enough to think so. 
Kamala Harris's problem is that Kamala Harris actually is a vain and petty person who is very shallow in her thinking. She does not do the work. Don't believe me. This is not my criticism, by the way. This is her own staff's criticism behind the scenes when they backbite each other that she doesn't do the work. She doesn't put in the time. She's not professional. She's not prepared. And then when people criticize her, she gets mad at the staff. Her entire reason for being on that stage is to be a black woman as vice president of the United States. It's not racist to say it. It's the truth. That's why Joe Biden picked her. It's the same reason he picked Katanji Brown Jackson. He wanted a black woman. He wanted to check a box. He wanted to keep a promise. He wanted diversity. Not of thought, just of color. The moment she can accept that, she will find some inner peace about the position in which she's in. But she clearly doesn't. You know, her national security advisor has just left her office. Nancy McEldowney. She worked with Harris and she took office. She's left. Former ambassador to Bulgaria, one-time director of the State Department's Foreign Service Institute, she advised both Harris and Joe Biden on a range of global issues, including getting out of Afghanistan, negotiations with Iran, and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. She's accompanied Harris on a spring of official visits to Central America, Asia, and Europe that featured high-profile gaffes and awkward moments, and she's done. She's had enough. You would think wanting to advise the vice president during times of globally momentous events would be a big thing, but it's not. This all reminds me going back to the Harris campaign and its implosion. Where Jonathan Martin and Alexander Burns, who are now writing the tell-all book about the run-up to the Biden presidency, they wrote a profile of Kamala Harris's campaign unraveling. Here's the subtitle. Ms. Harris is the only 2020 Democrat who has fallen hard out of the top tier of candidates. She has proved to be an uneven campaigner who changed her message and tactics to little effects and has a staff torn into factions. That was her campaign. It's nothing different. One advisor, this is a direct quote, one advisor said the fixation that some younger staffers have with liberals on Twitter distorted their view of what issues and moments truly mattered, joking that it was not President Trump's account that should be taken offline, as Ms. Harris had urged, but rather those of their own trigger-happy communications team. Kamala Harris has left disasters in the wake of every office she's ever been in, from Attorney General to Senator to Vice President of the United States. The problem at this point, we should say is not her staff. It's not how the Biden administration manages her. It's her. The problem is her. And if she could accept that, she's young enough, she should be able to accept that she's the problem and change her ways, maybe she can actually get a clue. But right now, she just needs to accept the job of the vice president is meaningless. She's there to be a figure to check a box for diversity, and that's it. And she can stop worrying about everything else. She's probably never going to be president of the United States. Vice presidents these days rarely are able to do that, and there's an aggressive campaign already out to stop her because everyone else in the Democratic Party knows what Kamala Harris doesn't know. Kamala Harris lacks discipline, lacks the willingness to learn, and thinks that everything should be handed to her. And if it's not, she immediately presumes it's racism and sexism and not that she's an idiot, which is actually the answer. This is, I don't even have a transition to move from that hard truth into another truth here, uh, that you can be part of the conservative movement in ways you've never expected. You can amplify your dollars and your giving to the conservative movement and help take back the country from the left simply by moving your cell phone account from where it is to Patriot Mobile. Then you can move your phone number over. You can bring your phone if it's unlocked. If you have a locked phone, you can get a new one from Patriot Mobile. And you get free activation with my name. All you do is you go to patriotmobile.com slash Eric. Patriotmobile.com slash E-R-I-C-K. And you can sign up, bring your account over, and uh, they give a portion of their profits to the conservative cause. Now, there are other companies that purport to do this sort of thing. 
And those companies tend to be owned by other companies that uh, do multiple different fronts for trying to get you to be a cell phone subscriber. At Patriot Mobile, they're just committed to the conservative cause. They're Christians. They're conservatives. They want to help. The entire reason the company was started was to do this, to amplify your dollars with theirs to help the conservative movement by giving a portion of their profits. And to reward you, they give you great discounts. You come over, you're a veteran, a first responder, a teacher, a gun owner, you name it. You can probably get a discount from them. Just talk to them. Go to patriotmobile.com slash eric. PatriotMobile.com slash E-R-I-C-K. You can also call them. They have 100% U.S.-based customer service. 972-PATRIOT. Hello there. It is Eric Erickson here. The Eric Erickson Show. Glad to have you with me. Let's see. I think I can squeeze in a phone call here. I think I can get to Scott. You're up next. Welcome. Hey, Scott. Good day, Eric. How are you? Great. I'm What's fine. How are you? Well, a couple of things that are really bothering me with regards to Iran and people who have very short memories and we've got thousands uh, up to date. We've got thousands of victims of different uh, bombings, whether it goes back to the Marine barracks, uh, the U.S. Embassy in 1983, uh, shipping. Uh, they've just they've just got a terrible, terrible record of, of killing Americans. And so what we find out is a lot of people got federal court judgments, and these federal court judgments couldn't be collectible because of U.S. law, because you couldn't fund those judgments with taxpayer expense. So what happened is that there were sanctions, and uh, Senator uh, Isaacson, along with some other senators, under uh, the Obama administration in December of I think, uh, eight, I guess it was December of eight. Scott, I got less than a minute now. Well, what I need for you to do is, is think about, uh, why Congress took $7 billion and was initially going to give it to the people and the victims of, of 9-11, but no one is talking about billions and billions of judgments against the Iranian government. And now we're going to give seven and a half or eight billion dollars right. to the Iranians if if uh, we pursue this. Well, and, and it, it just it's, seems it's not only that, Scott. You got to remember as well that the Obama administration, by executive order, released a bunch of Iranian money out of uh, that was locked in American bank accounts uh, and sent it back to them years ago. It wasn't our money; it was their money, but we had frozen it. Uh, they simply don't care about what Iran has done to us. It's 2022. Things are still crazy. Yeah, things haven't settled down. And now you got the Federal Reserve and interest rates, you got the economy, you got inflation. A lot of banks won't even return your phone call. Let's say you're a small business and you need a loan for $750,000 or higher. You see an opportunity where banks, they don't even want to see you. You want to buy a building, you want to build a building, reach out to the Frost family at First Liberty Building and Loan. They've been helping small businesses become big businesses since the 1990s. They want to help you if they can. So spend 10 minutes with them. See if you're a good fit for them and they're a good fit for you. Their website is firstlibertyga.com. That's firstlibertyga.com. Again, you need a loan, $750,000 or higher. You're a small business and you see an opportunity to grow. Share it with the Frost family and see if they can help you. Firstlibertyga.com. That's firstlibertyga.com. First Liberty Building and Loan can help businesses nationwide become bigger businesses.